Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Devin. Good to be here. Oh, and it is good to be here with you as well. And I've been watching you all over on Vlad, on Valuetainment. I was watching some of you this morning and just soaking it all in as we were just sharing off screen. You grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in Queens, but where I grew up in Queens, you were all over there. And I'm just really excited to have you because this is an episode like no other and a story like no other as well. And where I really want to begin, Michael, is going back to your childhood, growing up in Brooklyn. And for those of you that maybe aren't as familiar with Michael and New York City and the, the New York City mafia and the five families and so forth, it's the hub. It's the central. And Michael, I want you to take us back and really just describe what it was like during the time period that you grew up in Brooklyn, and what was the culture like? Well, we grew up in uh, Williamsburg, Greenpoint section of Brooklyn, and that section was really divided into two distinct areas. One section were all Italians, the other section were all Polish. So obviously I lived in the Italian section. Uh, my dad was one of 19 kids, so I was surrounded by family, cousins, aunts, uncles. We were one big community of Francis's at that point. And so we knew everybody in the neighborhood. And it was great. You know, my early days, my early childhood days were great because of the fact that it was all about family. Um, my dad was obviously a very prominent figure during that time. And it, it was pretty good at a young age. From that point, we moved to Long Island when I was around 10 years old. Things got a little worse at that point, or a little different, I should say, maybe not worse, because it was during the 60s when my dad started to have a lot of trouble, uh, several indictments, um, you know, it was a different neighborhood, you know, the big difference between living in Brooklyn and then moving out to Long Island, the suburb. So we, we certainly didn't know as many people, but my dad's reputation out there grew quickly. Uh, he was a major target of law enforcement, so we had law enforcement around us all the time. I had some issues in school as a result of the publicity my dad had. So, you know, but even though we were still a tight knit family, but it, it just changed a lot when we moved out to Long Island. And Michael, for those of the viewers and listeners that aren't as familiar with you as I am, can you just describe to us how prominent of a figure your father actually was? I know that he was the underboss of the Colombo family. But I heard you say that he was, in his day, the equivalent, if not bigger, of, of John Gotti in terms of publicity and being that infamous mob figure. Can you just describe for everybody that's listening what that was like and what, to what extent that actually was? Yeah, there, there's no question. The best way to describe him for people today that understand that uh, is that he was the John Gotti of his day in terms of law enforcement investigations, media attention. He was that high profile. And, um, you know, it was difficult because back then, you know, we had law enforcement around us all the time because dad was such a major target. Man, he was in the newspaper, he was on television, he was on radio, uh, he was indicted several times. So he was going to trials. There were very serious charges. So, I mean, it was, it was a media circus, uh, you know, I guess I could say. And, um, you know, it was, it was, again, anybody that knows John Gotti and the level of attention that he got, just put that back in the 60s, obviously before the days really of social media, uh, but the days of television and print and magazines and everything else, and uh, you can make a very valid comparison. Now, Michael, when you look at Gotti, and he was very outlandish in your face, he would beat a case and be all over the newspapers, and he was... He was just out there, and that's how he really gained his popularity and so forth. Now, was your dad so famous because of the same reason that he was so in your face, or was there another reason as to why Sonny Francis was, was so infamous and had eyes on him 24-7? My dad was, uh, I would say, the polar opposite of John Gotti. My dad never spoke to the press, never thumbed his nose in their face, um, he would walk past them when they were outside like they weren't even there. He wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't make a comment. Uh, my dad did not drive in limousines. 
I remember, you know, my mom used to make fun of him because he would drive a red Plymouth Valiant to that. He would drive himself. He didn't want to be, you know, ostentatious in that regard. He just couldn't help it. My dad's stature and my dad's charisma and the way he carried himself and the way people spoke about him. Uh, he was just at that point in time, I think he would, he would be the prototypical gangster at, at that point. I think, you know, I mean, I heard other reasons. I heard that, you know, he told me that Robert Kennedy really had it in for him uh, for certain reasons. And uh, he just he just became the guy. And of course, that had implications for how people treated you. I was remember it's so funny. I was listening to one interview and you said you would never get strike strike three called at your baseball games when your dad was around. They knew better to do that. So what was what was that like? Just growing up, did you use it in a way of you better not mess with me because you know who dad is? Or was it a thing where people just already knew who dad was and as a result, they just let you be? Were you the popular guy? What was that like? I was popular in school, but mainly uh, because I was an athlete, you know, and athletes get, you know, they get popular because of uh, virtue of playing sports. Uh, I had some issues uh, in school with kids because they didn't really grasp the understanding of, you know, what it meant for my father to be who he was. Uh, you know, whenever there was a newspaper article that called him a mafia dad or whatever, some kids in school would make remarks and I'd have fights with them. You know, we would fight over it. Um, but I, I don't I, I can honestly say, Devin, I didn't act any differently. I didn't, you know, put on a swagger because of who my dad was. I didn't hide from it. Um, it, it just, uh, you know, in that regard, um, it, it didn't affect me much. Where it affected me was, you know, having law enforcement around all the time. It, it made me create a, a hatred for law enforcement because I saw my dad as the hero and law enforcement as the enemy. That was kind of the mindset that I adopted during that time. It it's crazy. It's eyes on you 24 seven around the house. That's, that's crazy. Now in the eyes of law enforcement, your dad was the target, the, the bad guy to go after what I've noticed growing up around these neighborhoods that I've grew up and also watching the movies and so forth. People have somewhat of an admiration of the mafia, even where I grew up, where we were talking off camera, people that aren't involved in the life look at mobsters as sometimes even good people who will protect the neighborhood. Why do you think that there is such a disparity between what law enforcement sees in the mafia and what the general public is seeing in the mafia? Well, a couple of reasons, you know, within their own communities, our own neighborhoods, um, guys like my dad would take care of the people within the neighborhood take care of the community and they were seen as good guys you know they were also carried themselves differently they drove the nice cars they had an air of respect about them um so within their own confines they were viewed in a very good light you know as far as law enforcement was concerned you know look they knew the other side of that they were investigating these guys where people in the neighborhood weren't investigating them they were just living with them Law enforcement was investing them, investigating them, watching what they what they're doing, seeing if they're committing criminal activity, uh, realizing that they could be a danger to society in some way. So um, and they looked at them, you know, they knew that we took a criminal oath. And as a result of that, we were on the other side of the law. You know, another thing I, I can tell you this, Devin, when The Godfather came out in the early 70s it brought a tremendous air of respectability not only to the people that knew them in the neighborhoods but really to the entire world the godfather had a major impact on the way people viewed people in that life it elevated their stature to a great degree and as a result did that in and of itself bring any more unwanted attention to the life oh there's no question that it did yeah, I think law enforcement really resented it. Uh, unfortunately, around the same time that The Godfather came out, Joe Colombo was starting his Italian American Civil Rights League that the government absolutely hated. They hated the fact they saw it as a huge farce uh, um, on Colombo's part to try to gain an air, uh, an air of respectability when the way the government viewed it, they were, they were just mobsters and criminals. 
So, um, yeah, it, it, it added to government vengeance, government resentment, no question about it. And as you look back at that time that your dad was most active, were the crimes that were being committed or the businesses that were being run the same as the type that you and the people that you were involved with, it was, were they the same or did they evolve or change as the times evolved and changed? Well, you know, from the time I can remember, obviously, you know, we were involved with the unions, taking over union uh, control of certain uh, locals. And even, you know, on a Teamster level, you know, that there was control there at a very high level. And most all of the unions had some kind of mob infiltration or control, no doubt about that. Uh, the numbers game, you know, was always very popular. Gambling, always very popular. Um, I will say this, and, and I know I get kickback on this all the time. During my time in that life, and as far as my father was concerned, drugs were off limits to us. We did not get involved with drugs. And I can say this across the board, during my time in that life, drugs were outlawed. I'm not saying that certain guys weren't doing it on the side and maybe sneaking and trying to make a buck, but we weren't major drug dealers. That's a fact. Uh, but, you know, all the traditional things, you know, sometimes you're shaking down a business and, you know, trying to take control. Those things always remained in place. You know, with respect to what I did, I, I had a little bit more of a business sense and I approached things in that regard. I wasn't really into many of the traditional ways that you guys were making money at that time. Uh, it was just my personal thing, you know. Oh, I, trust me, I could tell you weren't into the regular thing, Michael. That, that will become obvious in a few minutes when we discuss a little bit about that. So you go off to high school and you're growing up as a teenager. Now, for everybody that's listening, your dad's this big mobster, but he's not taking his mob life back to back home is from what I, is what I understand from all the interviews that I've heard of you. He kept a distinction between home and work. Is that correct? That's correct. He would never discuss, you know, that business inside the house, in the home. We were a family. Um, I, I don't know how he did it, but he had a, you know, I mean, he would walk outside, law enforcement would be out there. He would walk past them like they didn't even exist. Never discussed his any criminal activities whatsoever in our presence. He tried as best he could to just keep us as a family. Michael, outside of the mob and the mafia, what are some of the, the lessons that you really took from your father? Just as a man, how he carried himself, what are things that you've taken with you that have influenced the way that you now live your life? Well, my dad had a tremendous impact on me because he taught me some very good things in life. You know, he taught me never to be quick to judge somebody, always to give somebody the benefit of the doubt, be the last person to judge uh, rather than the first. He always taught me, uh, you know, not to speak ill of people, uh, to be a good listener, not to run my mouth off. Uh, he taught me how to respect women. Um, he taught me, uh, you know, I saw that he had a great love for me and my brothers and sisters. So, I mean, uh, you know, those things I learned from him. And, you know, on a criminal side, he tried to teach me how to not get caught, you know, <laughs> by doing things that would get me in trouble. So, you know, and, and I, I, look, my dad, you know, he held himself pretty well. I mean, he, he held himself as a person of integrity and I admired that in him. So Michael, eventually you become in your late teens and at some point your father is sentenced to 50 years. Is that correct? Yes. So explain to me what's going on, not only in your life, but what is the family situation like? Because I've heard you say on many occasions that this lifestyle totally tears families apart. So how did it affect the family dynamic that your dad was now sentenced to 50 years in prison? Oh, well, it was terribly disruptive, Devin. I mean, it's, that's an abnormal situation in anyone's home. You know, I had brothers and sisters younger than me. It had a tremendous impact on them. It had a tremendous impact negatively on my mother. Um, you know, when my dad first went away in the federal prison system at that point, um, you had the, the, the procedure was you were allowed one three-minute phone call per month. 
and one visit per month. And my dad was originally, initially rather, uh, designated to Leavenworth, Kansas. So we lived in New York. So we had one three minute phone call with him a month and one visit. And as time went on, my father became less, of an, less and less of an influence in the house because he couldn't deal with our everyday life and our issues. So you grew further apart from him. My mother grew further apart from him. My brothers and sisters hardly even knew him. They were younger. And, you know, it just, and, and trying to fight his case all the time. And then me getting involved in things, it was terribly, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I've always said this, Devin, and I'll say it again. I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been in some way devastated. And that's the pattern, that's the truth. And uh, there aren't many families that escape that, if any. Yeah, I've heard you share that so, so many times, and it's true. All one has to do is do some research or, or look at a paper and it's torn apart. Now, a lot of attention gets brought to your father, but a person that I think deserves equally as much respect and honor and tribute is your mother. Because your mother went through, I think, 30 plus years of not having her husband around and still sticking with the family, raising the family. What do you admire most about your mother? You know, Devin, I, I, uh, it's a tough subject for me. And I guess you know, it's funny that you bring this up. My wife and I were just talking about it this morning. You know, I never really looked, even though I'm, uh, I participated in the Newsday uh, YouTube videos, I never really watched them. For some reason, I don't watch a lot of things that have to do with myself and my family. Uh, but my wife brought something up this morning. She was pointing some things out to me that kind of got me upset. Uh, maybe it's something I don't want to deal with. I don't want to think about it. But And one of the major issues was talking about my mother. And I, I finally have come to realize that my mother really was a victim in all of this, really the victim. And for many, many years, I didn't see it that way because I was so joined at the hip with my dad, both in our oath and as his son. And, um, but when I look back and really take an objective look, I saw my mother was really the victim in all of this. I mean, she was 16 years old when he married her. She didn't really know anything that was going on in his life. I found out later, she didn't know that he was married prior and had three children. And she didn't know that until after they got married. So, but I never knew this. I never knew this. And so a lot of the torment that went on and the turbulence in our house, my mother never talked about it. I have to give her credit. She didn't complain about things in that way. And she never really let me know what was going on in her mind. So, you know, she does deserve a lot of credit. She did hang 33 years with my father. She did try to prove his innocence. She worked hard on that. She did raise the children, even though it became a a very difficult task for her because my brothers and sisters were again, you know, emotionally really distraught and disturbed over what happened in our household. So, I mean, I'm giving you a long answer, Devin, but the bottom line is she, she was a hero in, in many, many ways. Now, Michael, what I'm interested in is what is the best dish that she cooked? <laughs> she was a tremendous cook. She was great with her pasta. I mean, lasagna was terrific. She was just oh. a good cook in every respect, you know? And she could whip up a meal in five minutes. That's oh. uh, that was wonderful. Yeah, I know. I, I I'm reminiscing. You said lasagna. My grandmother Bruna barely spoke a word of English, but man, that lasagna you can't you can't beat it. Right on Pickin Avenue and Ozone Park. Oh, I I miss those days. I miss those days, Michael. But regardless, as we get away from pasta, so your your dad is is going off for fifty years, and I as. From my research and my understanding, this is when things kind of took a turn for you because you were on the path to becoming a doctor. But That's explain true. to us what the heck happened that you went from aspiring to be a doctor to taking this oath. Well, you know, my dad now is faced with a 50 year sentence. He was 50 years old when he went into prison. So I figured, hey, he's going to die in there. He always claimed his innocence, swore to me that he wasn't a, a bank robber. He didn't order bank robberies. Uh, Joe Colombo, who was the boss of the family and, and who was very close with me, he kind of took me under his wing. I got very involved in the Italian American Civil Rights League movement at that time. I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends and I was highly influenced. Hey, if you don't help your dad, he's going to die in prison. And, uh, you know, that's what kind of said, hey, 
you know, I, I can't just go to school. I got to help my father. My family's falling apart. And when I went to visit with him in Leavenworth and he said, well, if you want to help me, then the best way is to become a member of our life. And I said, okay, dad, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. So that's basically how it happened. Did you, did you really have an understanding of, of what that meant when he said, okay, I want you to do it the right way by becoming a made guy? Did you really understand what the significance of that was at that moment? Honestly, I did not. I, uh, well, I, look, Devin, I will say something. My dad looked at me and he asked me one question and he said to me, Michael, you know, and I don't like to be offensive in this regard, but I'm being, just being honest. He said, if you ever had to kill somebody, could you do it? And I said, you know, I thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, dad, under the right circumstances, yeah, I think I could do it. And that was it. And he said to me, that's the right answer. And that's when he said, go home. Basically, I'm proposing you into this lifestyle. Because, I mean, he knew who I was. He knew I had it in me. You know, I'm, I'm his son. So he, he knows me. He knows my character. He knows what I'm capable of. But I had to answer that question to him. But I didn't give it a lot of thought. I, it, it was like a little bit stunning for a minute. Again, I want to make it really clear. I never aspired to be in the mob. I had no, hey, I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps. No. If you would have asked me back then what I wanted to be, I wanted to play center field for the New York Yankees. If you can notice, I'm still feeling that way. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was my goal. I, I didn't in any way want to be part of my dad's life until this situation came about. And I said, okay, dad, if this is the way to help you, I feel responsible to help you. So I'll do it. Were the guys that you were hanging around, such as Joe Colombo and, and other of your dad's close friends, were they pushing you at all to join this life or were they just like an uncle that were there for you? Yeah, they didn't push me to join the life. No, but they rather than look, they, they love me. They, you know, I, I knew a lot of them, you know, my whole life. They were close to my dad. Um, but they did say, you know, if look, your dad's going to die in prison if, if we don't help him out. You know, you believe he's innocent. And I was the oldest son in the house at that point in time. My older brother, he just was the kind of kid, he's not getting involved in anything. That's it. He, you know, just to give you an idea, you know, he went off to, ran off to San Francisco and became like a hippie living in a commune back then. That, that was his mentality. <laughs> so can't get mad at him. That's just who he was, you know. He didn't want to know from mob or anything else. That's, that was him. So uh, I felt, okay, this is, this is my responsibility if I want to help my family. So, Michael, before you actually become a made man, was there a type of recruitment process or a period between when you're or actually I want to know about what was the moment when your dad told you to go home? Someone will be in contact with you. And then what did that look like when somebody first came in contact with you and sort of got you involved? Well, little Jojo Vitaka, who was a soldier, he was one of my guys, he was in my dad's crew. Again, I knew him all my life. Uh, he called me and he said, come meet me in Brooklyn. And I went into Green Point. He had a bar on uh, Metropolitan Avenue and I went and met with him. And he said, come on, I got a message from your father. I'm taking you to meet the boss. And he was very proud. He said, I'm so proud. I'm so happy. He was thrilled that my dad had proposed me, you know, because to him, it was a, it was a, a wonderful thing. And so, you know, again, I didn't know what boss was going to tell me. My dad didn't prepare me for anything. I'm, I'm going in cold, you know. And, uh, you know, so I sat down with the boss at, at the time, Tom DeBella. He was acting boss for Carmine Persico. And, and he just ran it down to me. He said, you know, your father, I remember one thing he absolutely said. He said, your father sent me a message. He said, you want to become a member of, that, of this life. Is that true? And I said, yeah, if that's what my dad wants, that's what I want. And he looked at me very sternly and he said, I didn't ask you what your father wanted. I'm asking you if that's what you want, Michael. And I said, yes. Um, yeah, I want that. <laughs> I don't even know. You know, I'm just, yeah. My, but in my, in my heart, I said, yeah, my dad wants it. So I want it. It wasn't like, yeah, I can't wait to do this. If you understand the difference, you know, so. And then he ran it down for me and he said, look, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family. And he said, and what that means is if your mother is sick and dying and you're at her bedside and we call you to service, you leave your mother, you come and serve us from now on, 
This family is number one in your life before anything and everything else in your life. And he said, do you understand and do you agree? And I said, yes. It sounds, Michael, like your dad was, was your best friend. Like you really, you really idolized him and looked up to him. And it, no doubt. Yeah, you had such tremendous, it, it, it shines through every time that I listen to you. And it's admirable because that's, that's how I am with my father as well. So I just want to, I want to respect that and honor that because that's, that's amazing. And then, so Michael, between the time that you first met up with the boss, uh, first off, how old were you at this point? I was like 21. Okay, so you are a very young guy. And by the way, is this typical for a person to be proposed for membership this early? Um, during that time, there, there was a 20-year moratorium on bringing guys into the life. They used the term, the books were closed. And um, so there were guys that were waiting to be, that were proposed, that were waiting to get straightened out, the terminology, and for 20 years. So they were older, obviously. Um, they might have been proposed when they were in their 20s. I don't think that's abnormal, especially when it's a, a, you know, a situation where a father is bringing a son in, so on. You, you know, usually bring them in early. Uh, so I don't think it was that out of the ordinary. But during that time, um, I was proposed with guys that had been waiting 20 years. They were in their 40s, 50s even. There were a lot older guys around with me. Wow, that's, that's crazy. So, Michael... There is a period between when you get straightened out and when you first sit down with Joe Colombo. That's correct, right? Uh, well, sit down with Tom DeBella. Tom DeBella, excuse me. Well, Joe Colombo had been shot. You know the situation. He was uh, he eventually died from the wounds. Right. So there is a time period be between when you sit down with Tom DeBello and then you get made. Now, what is that? Is that like a tryout period or, or what is that all about? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, in college, I describe it as a pledge period. You're proving yourself worthy to become a member of that life. And uh, you're tested in many ways. And they watch you, your character, the way you behave yourself, if you can take orders, how you carry yourself. Um, and then before, before you are actually made, when the day comes when you pass through your own family and they say, okay, he got what it takes, he passed the test. Then they put your name on a piece of paper and they send it around to all the other families. And they say, is there any reason why Michael Francis should not be made? Do you know anything we don't know? Is there something about him? So that's the final you know, security check, I would say. And Michael, what are some of the disqualifying factors that could go into your proposal being negated? And nope, Michael Francis cannot come into this life because of X, Y, and Z. Well, if they ever found out that you did anything to violate another made guy or maybe their wife or daughter, um, you know, maybe you were cooperated with the police at some point in time, you know, just things like that. I mean, those would be the two most serious charges. I mean, you can't say, you know, well, this guy beat me for money and therefore he shouldn't be. I mean, that's what guys on the street do sometimes, you know, so that wouldn't disqualify it. That would be worked out. But, you know, again, if they thought you were cooperating, that's the main thing. Oh, this guy talks to police or he's got a friend with a cop or he cooperated at some point. That would exclude you. Right. OK, so that I think it was 1975 Halloween when you are finally brought into the life. Can you walk us through that ritual, per se, and what that looked like for you? Yeah, I mean, it was a dimly lit room late at night. There was six of us that got straightened out that night. And um, it was lit very late. You know, it had to be a, obviously it's a covert meeting. They didn't want law enforcement to know. So they choose a place that uh, is obscure and they make sure that nobody's being surveilled or, or anything else. So, um, you know, before we even drove to the place, we drove all around. We made sure nobody was following us, but that was normal activity. And then we got to the place and um, we were brought into a room one at a time, this is individual. The boss was seated at the head of a horseshoe configuration. Consigliere and the underboss were to his left and right. All our capo regimes, our captains were alongside of them. We had about 15 in our family at that point. You, you walk down the aisle, stand in front of the boss. Um, he took a knife, cut my finger, some blood dropped on the floor. He cupped my hands, 
took a picture of a saint, a Catholic altar card, they put it in your hands and light it. Uh, it burns quickly, it's, it's merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life into Cosa Nostra. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers and you'll die, burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? Yes, I do. That's it, very quick. And the other five guys went in the room, they all took the oath. And then right after that, we went into, we were in Joe Colombo's son, Anthony's catering hall. He had a catering hall back then. So then they had a, a meal prepared for us. And we went next door, the six of us did, and all the captains, we all sat down, had a banquet. That's what Italians do. We celebrate everything like that. And then the one thing that really stood out that night is that little Jojo Vitaco, who uh, he was only a soldier, but he, he asked permission to be at that ritual because of me, because he said, look, I know Michael since he's a kid, and, and it would be you know, such a privilege if I can see him get made. So he was there. And he walked into the room with a brown paper bag and he said, boss, should I give them all their bag of money now? And the irony in that is everybody thinks that you come into the mob and, you know, they start handing you money like, oh, you're going to get wealthy. Where it's just the opposite, Devin. When you come in that life, you start paying up. Now, you can use the life to your advantage, whatever advantage it might be able to afford you in going out there and earning a living. But they're not handing you anything. you got to pay up. And that's where you start to... You, you differentiate yourself. You're either an earner in that life or you're not an earner in that life. And if you're an earner, yeah, they're going to protect you because like anything else, they want money. Money makes these things work in, in any walk of life. And if you're not an earner, well, then you're going to be doing other kind of work to serve the family. And you kind of make your own way at that point in time. Michael, I want to stop here for one second because you mentioned that at this ritual, there were all these super powerful people, the boss, the conciliary, the capos. And I was reading your book. I'll make you a deal. You can't refuse. And there was something that, I, that struck me. You said that if you took some of these bosses in the families and you placed them in the corporate setting, that they would be just as successful in the corporate world as they were in their mob world because they had this street sense. So my question would be, I get that they have this street sense because this is the way that we're raised, but is it possible for somebody that just grew up and had a normal life to still develop this street sense? Or is it only for maybe people that were in the mob or lived the street life? What's your take on that? I don't think you can develop a street sense unless you have experience on the street. It's very simple because you wouldn't know what it you wouldn't know what it was if you didn't experience it. So it's not like, hey, you know, street sense is in the dictionary and, you know, let me let me take a course on it. It's it's just, you know, you learn by what you do and by your experiences. And I will tell you this, you know, guys like Carmine Persico and even Carlo Gambino and Paul Castellano. These were very smart guys. Um, now, what tainted them is that they grew up with the street sense. They grew up with that part in them. And therefore they were, it was okay for them to commit whatever activity they had on the street in order to better themselves. But these were very smart people, very, very smart people. And had they not grown up on the street and they were put into a, a legitimate situation, they would have absolutely done well in my opinion. No that, doubt. that was gonna be my next question. That. Yeah, abs absolutely. They had all of that talent. And what strikes me, it seems like they would be such great entrepreneurs. They would be so creative because that's one thing that I also took from your book is the importance of being resourceful, that that life forced you to be resourceful in everything that you did. Now, Michael, before we get to a lot of the ways in which you were resourceful, I want to talk a little bit about the beginning stages before we get a little bit to the description of what was going on with the gas and how you made tons and tons and tons of money but before we get to that what was the initial time in this life like because from the outside looking in it looks like you immediately get rich you have all these cars you're living this lavish life is it actually like that absolutely not my my first my years as a recruit, um, because of my father's name, I became immediate target of law enforcement. 
By the time I was 23 years old, I had been indicted four times. I went to trial three times. I was flat broke from defending myself and from spending well over a year in courtrooms, uh, paying bails and paying lawyers as best I can, and then trying to scratch out a living. I'm out of school. You know, my dad's not there. We had money issues within our household. So it was a real struggle starting out for me. Um, and, you know, so no, I mean, again, nobody handed me anything. What, what my saving grace was, was number one, that I beat all the cases I was involved in, or I would have went to jail at an early age. And then number two, there was one gentleman by the name of Vinny who had a flea market out in Long Island who asked me, uh, he just took a liking to me and he said, I want you to manage the market on the weekends for me. He says, and I'll pay you because I was on trial all week long. And I said, Vinny, thanks. I said, I'll work hard. Don't worry about it. I just need to earn some money. And where am I going to get a job? You know, just weekends. So he gave me a job. But that's when I started. That's when the criminal stuff, I think, kicked in on me, Devin, because I said, here's the way it was, but just basically, I don't want to bore you with too many details, but I was, I was in charge of, you know what a flea market is? People come in, they rent space, and they put up their product. Their well, of course right? I do, and I love them. Yeah, so I would have these people, it was in a, a, an airport out in Long Island, and I'd have people coming to me offering money to get a good space and offering me sit, a considerable amount of money. So I went to Vinny, and I said, Vinny, these people are offering me money. I won't take it to dishonor you, but why don't I take it and we'll split it. And you can be the good guy. I'll be the guy. They're offering it to me anyway. He said, great. Because he had a street sense too, right? He was a street guy. And then I said to him, hey, Vinny, these guys are always looking for money. They always need money. They can't go to a bank. Why don't we lend them money? They're a captive audience. We got them here every week. We'll charge them an interest rate and you know, a couple of points a week. And before you know it, I'm in the Shylock business. So, you know, I'm taking bribes and I'm in the Shylock business just from working in a flea market. So I said, oh, it's pretty good. I make them, you know, a couple of grand on a weekend. I even told him, Vinny, you don't have to pay me anymore. I'll make my own way here. So that's when the entrepreneurial street sense automatically kicked in. So eventually you get involved in much, much bigger things. So describe for us as best you can how this whole gasoline government tax fraud situation evolved and and what was the height of it how much were you bringing in at the time and just describe the lifestyle a little bit you know like many other things i think there's a uh, uh, a fallacy out there where people think that we sit in our social clubs and we figure out every business that we want to infiltrate and, and uh, so on and so forth it's not it's not that way many times people come to us they have a scheme to defraud their company. They think they can make money with us. We'll protect them. We'll finance them. We'll never tell on them. That happened to me so often. Guys would come to me, major companies, General Motors Corporation, GE Credit, guys within the company. Hey, I figured out a way, Michael. Let's do this. Not kidding. So this guy comes to me that has a bunch of gas stations on Long Island. He's being uh, shaken down by some guys in another family, Genovese guys. He comes to me for protection. He tells me he's got a germ of an idea of taking tax money from the government. That's kind of music to my ears. I hated the government. So I helped him out. You know, I got rid of the guys. I, I was able to back them off and we went into business together. And that germ of an idea that started out with a two week take of $320,000 in tax money over an eight year period, I built into, into eight to $10 million a week over 350 gas stations that we either owned or operated and 18 companies that I had that were licensed to collect tax on every gallon of gasoline. And what were some of your favorite purchases or things to do with this money now that you were bringing it up to $10 million per week? Oh my goodness. Well, we brought a, uh, I bought a, a Learjet, Lear 25A. I had a, I uh, spent 350,000 we did, he and I, on a big uh, RV that we had that was, you know, decked out to the hilt. Uh, I had a Bell helicopter to get around town in. Um, you know, I had two automobile dealerships at the time. I had a movie production company. I was making movies, some of it with golden, stolen gas tax money. Um, I had a house in Florida. I had a house in California. I built a, uh, an 8,000 square foot house in Long Island uh, on two acres of property with a racquetball court in it. 
Um, but I, again, you know, I also had legitimate business. My dealerships were doing extremely well. Um, my um, restaurants that I were involved in were doing extremely well. So uh, I had a leasing company that was doing well. I had two body shops, auto body shops. So, you know, I was able to, um, you know, cover my earnings from legitimate earnings that I had also. So I didn't have any tax issues at that point too. So Michael, everybody in the mob world is thinking that Michael Francis is super successful. And you probably thought that yourself if I had to take a guess. My question for you is, as you've grown older, and Mike, Michael, you're 68? 70. 70. My goodness. You don't look 70. Well, I don't feel 70, Devin, but <laughs> my father was 103. So we, I we know. Asked. That is that is unbelievable. But there is such a progression from that period when you were in your 30s to now. And I'm curious, how has your definition of success changed from the time you were bringing in all of this money and you were super successful in that sense to where you are in this part of your life now where you're speaking, you're speaking the word of God and you're, you're doing things like this with me? How has your definition of success changed? Well, look, you know, success is, is always measured in terms of dollars and cents. We understand that. That's the real world. So you want to be able to pay your bills, go on vacation, go out to eat when you like, take a week off, you know, not going to work in the morning. That's my definition of financial success. And then, you know, be able to retire at some point and still have a good life. That's my real definition. It's not owning all the buildings, half of the town. And, you know, I don't need a helicopter and a plane anymore. Although a plane would be great with all the traveling I'm doing with these restrictions that we have. So that, would, that wouldn't be a luxury anymore. It would be, a, it's almost a necessity with all the traveling. But, um, you know, my, my real definition of success is being able to spend time with my family, having people look up to me, because I'm a benefit to them in some way, shape, or form. Uh, just basically doing the right things, having children that love me, having a wife that cares about me and loves me, um, uh, having a community that talks well about me because I'm doing good things in the community. That's successful to me. It's not measured in dollars and cents anymore, although I don't want to minimize the fact that we do need money to live properly. Oh, yeah, definitely. And at one point, this kind of fairy tale life that you're living comes to a head and you end up going to prison for a little while. What was that? How did that evolve? And, and what did that look like? What type of sentence were you facing? Well, understand this, Devin. I was a target uh, from the time I was 19, 20 years old. I was throughout this whole period of time. I'm fighting law enforcement. I'm being arrested. I have indicted. I was indicted seven times. I was. I had two federal racketeering cases, a state racketeering case in Florida. I was constantly under investigation and constantly a major target of law enforcement. So, the success I enjoyed was all throughout that going on in my life too. So yes, now I uh, I accept a 10-year prison sentence, a 15 million dollar restitution, and I'm going off to prison. I wasn't afraid of prison because I had visited my dad all my life. And realistically, I knew that being in that life, I was going to do some time. So I wasn't afraid of prison. I certainly didn't want to go. Don't give me that. Uh, don't, don't mistake that. But um, I was prepared mentally and emotionally to go. I knew what the deal was. But, you know, there was more to it because I knew in making the deal to go to prison, I was also making the deal to walk away from that life. If I wasn't gonna walk away from the life, I would have fought the case. But it was all part of my plan to try to get away from a life that I thought was in severe trouble. And so, you know, look, it, it was a lot. I mean, because it wasn't only going to prison, it was betraying my oath because I was no longer gonna consider myself Cousin Ostra. Um, I knew that there was gonna be some severe consequences. I knew my dad was gonna be upset. I knew I was gonna have to face a lot of stuff. So. I was trying to get myself emotionally prepared for all of that also. So it was a very difficult time. It, it really was, no question about it. And then I knew law enforcement was gonna pressure me, um, you know, to, to try to become a witness. 
I didn't want any part of that, honestly. So I had all of these things that I knew I was going to be dealing with. It was tough. Oh, I could imagine. I, I, I can't imagine. Let me rephrase that. I can't imagine that. So at what point did you make that decision? Was it, were you still on the streets when you were thinking, I don't know if I want to do this anymore? Or was it when you were behind bars facing those 10 years that you made that decision that this is time for me to live a different life? No, I was on the street. I had just beat the Giul Giuliani indicted me on a big case. I was on trial for several months. I was acquitted in that case. And I knew they were preparing another indictment in the Eastern District of New York. Giuliani was in the Southern District. Um, but during that time, Devin, I'm watching all of these guys go down big time on racketeering cases. Commission case came about. I was in MDC for a while, the Metropolitan Detention Center, the federal jail. And I'm watching guys left and right go down, getting convicted and getting sentenced to 50, 70, 80, 100, 150 years, 200 years. And I said, man, I'm the youngest guy here, and I'm probably one of the most sought after guys. I've been under investigation half my life. I said, this is life is in trouble. I made my plea as part of my exit strategy. Because remember, up to that point, I had went to trial five times and beat every case. I had a good record. But I knew that at some point it was going to come to an end. And so I tried to cut my losses. And Michael, I know that your wife was very influential, Camille, during this time in your life. Am I correct by saying that? Absolutely. She was the, the final uh, factor, I would say, to say that, look, I'm in love with this girl. What am I going to do to her? She's 21 years old. If I stay in this life, she's going to end up marrying me and being without a husband. Why would I do that to her? It's either her and a life with her, or I stay in this life and let her go. It was one of the two. And I said, no, I'm in love with this girl and I'm not gonna do this to her. I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna try to have a life with her. And part of that, unfortunately, was me going away to prison, but she, you know, her faith allowed her to accept that. Mm. And as you talk about faith, you came to really know Jesus and your faith. How did that, arise did it just was it a, a matter of poof i'm in i'm in prison i'm in three years of solitary confinement which i know that you did was it a progress what did that look like for michael francis it, it was it was a progress in that my mother-in-law and my wife were devout christians and and watching them for the 18 months that i was with them before i went to prison um was I wasn't buying into it for myself at that point because I didn't understand the whole concept of Christianity and really redemption. Even though they were talking to me, I was still too much a part of the street, but I so respected the way they carried themselves. I respected their beliefs. My mother-in-law had a tremendous impact on me uh, because of the type of woman she was. My wife, even though she was a young girl, she carried herself so well. She really believed in the Lord. So I was fed this, I was kind of a searcher, but I wasn't totally buying into it, if you can understand. It really was the prison time I spent when I was in the hole um, that I started to really say, look, I may die in here. I may never get out of jail. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Where am I going? And really, that's, that's what caused me to, to really start to look. I think it's so interesting how there's a stark contrast between you mentioned earlier that you were just in that environment when your dad had gone to prison and you were hanging out with Joe Colombo and all of your father's friends. And then now you have your wife and her mother who are heavily in, in, in love, it sounds, with Jesus and they're, they're super Christian and they're into their faith. So on one end, you have one side that is influencing you in a somewhat negative way to go down they weren't directly, but they were involved in the life. Then you have your, your wife and her mother-in-law. So in the development of your children and speaking to kids, how important is it to surround yourself with driven and motivated people that are ambitious, but ambitious for the right reasons? What kind of influence does environment play in your opinion? 
Okay, the words I can use are the words that I echo continuously, even as late as yesterday in two church services that I delivered a message in. Uh, critical, vital, to surround yourself with the right people because I say this time and time again, um, that I believe with all my and what I've witnessed in others. Number one, in this world, we are who we hang out with, who we surround ourselves with. And number two, the path we take our life in our lives is going to depend upon who we are accountable to in our lives. When I was in the mob, I surrounded myself with mobsters. And I was accountable to my mob boss and my oath. And as a result, that was the path that I was on. And I felt it was the right thing to do at that time for a long period of time. When I got out of the life and I became a person of faith, I became accountable to my God first, my wife and children to protect them from me doing something wrong that would put them in harm's way. I'm now accountable to people in ministry that have faith in me, that believe in me. So as a result of who I'm accountable to, I stay on the right path. I try. So this is what I tell young people all the time when I visit prisons and juvenile halls or high schools or colleges, wherever I go. Two things, you are who you hang with, you must surround yourself with the right people. And number two, the path you take in life is gonna depend upon who you are accountable to. And I think those are the two goalposts, I would say, uh, bedrocks of where your life is going to go. Those choices. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite quotes is that in life we make decisions and those decisions make us. Exactly. So, so, so true. Now, Michael, when you look at when people are looking to, to study individuals and, and mentors and so forth, so often we study people who have been ultra successful in terms of they've made a huge impact on the world, positive. They made tons of money in a positive way. But do you think that there is an equivalent side to that or there's another side to that coin where you can also learn just as much from people that maybe didn't go the right route in life or they went down the the mob route, which in pub, pub, uh, popular terms is they went down the wrong path. So do you think we can learn just as much from people that went down the right path as we can from those that went down the quote unquote wrong path in life? Oh, there's no question about it, Devin. For 25 years now, um, I've speaking, been speaking all over the world in every kind of forum that you can imagine, from faith-based to prisons to corporate America to professional sports to ha uh, high school and, and uh, college sports to you name it. I've spoken at that kind of a forum and very, very successful people along with people that have not done so well in their life and others that have experienced real tragic situations. And the fact that I've been there and done that in many situations, I've enjoyed success. I've enjoyed, I, I've suffered through failure and failure on my own. I caused the failures, it was my fault. Bad choices that I made, you know, and, and for some reason I've been able to come out of it and then succeed again. So people are very attracted to that. How did you do that? You know, how did you fall on your face and come back? How did you do so many questions? And it doesn't matter, again, what walk of life they're in. I mean, I sit down with, with very, very successful people and they want to pick my brain and they have my advice and my counsel on a lot of things. You know, and, and look, I tell people all the time, you know, I said it yesterday in church. You know, if you've cleaned up your past, if you're a drug addict, went through a lot of stuff, you've cleaned it up. Who better than you? to minister or to counsel people that are going through that problem now because you have credibility. You've been there. You've done that. And look what you've done now to your life. You've turned it around. Redemption means a lot to people. It really does because redemption is a form of success. You've been in a bad place and now you've redeemed yourself. So you've succeeded. You've got out of it. And that's attractive to people. And I can tell you that from 25 years of experience. And I admire it. On my way home from work today, I was putting on what was it? Victory Church, I want to say, in in Three San Diego. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And I was watching it, and I was absolutely eating it up. And you profess your faith so well, and it's admirable. It really, really, really is to see. If one watches your videos, you can tell that you're just in in love with it. 
And it's amazing to see the transition from where you were to where you are right now. It is absolutely incredible. But you mentioned something about that you've experienced a lot of failures. And obviously, shocker, everybody that's listening and watching, Michael got out of prison and he's, he's living his life. But Michael, what was, in your eyes, your biggest failure? Whether it was monetary, family, what would you say is, was your biggest failure? You know, business failures, I don't, I don't take them to heart. You know what I mean? Look, I, I have a good attitude about it. When things don't succeed and I put an effort into it, I just look at it as it wasn't meant to be. And I move on to the next thing. I am entrepreneurial in that way. I'm always going to find a way, you know, or figure it out. Or, uh, so earning a living is not an, an issue to me. I don't look at those kind of failures. I get mad at myself. You know, sometimes I got involved in something that I shouldn't have. My wife will tell me, Michael, you know, don't get involved in so many things. You know, it's just my entrepreneurial spirit. Somebody comes with me a deal. It sounds good. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't really look at that. But, you know, to me, my greatest failure was going to prison. That's a failure. No matter how you look at it, you went to prison, you did something, even, even if people say you were framed and all of that stuff, my dad was framed. Yeah, he was framed, but he was framed because he was a mobster. And that's what, that's what law enforcement does. Sometimes you got to be realistic. It's not always perfect, the system. So, you know, I think that was a failure um, and, a, and a regret. I wish that I would have been smart enough not to allow that to happen, uh, but I couldn't avoid it. Um, you know, another failure that I see in life is I have two daughters from my first marriage that I don't have a great relationship with because they never really forgave me when I, you know, I was, the, I was married once for a short time and uh, that was, you know, 40 some odd years ago, but my, I've never been able to quite patch it up with my daughters. And that I think is a significant failure, even though I've tried, I'm not, I'm not gonna say I haven't tried, I've tried, but I didn't succeed. And what greater failure is that than, you know, not being able to have your own children around you that you love. So, and I look at it as, you know, the father, I should have been able to overcome that in some way, but I haven't been able to. So other than that, you know, I'll be honest, Devin, I don't want to sound like, you know, uh, narcissistic in any way, because I'm not, but I, I'm okay with my life, you know? And at this point, what are you most proud of? If, as you look back and you say, I I'm proud of that, the, this thing that I've done or, or these couple of things or these couple of decisions, what would that be for you? Well, listen, I, I am, uh, I I'm thankful that I did walk away from that life. I love what I'm doing now in the past 25 years. I, I love, I found out in life, Devin, and I mean this with all my heart, um, it is so much better to give than it is to receive because people, the appreciation that people show you is so encouraging and so uplifting. And I get emails, texts, messages through social media and email. These are people I don't even know, heard me speak, saw me some way, have been watching me on YouTube. My life has been able to do for them. So, you know, I, I think that's the most gratifying thing that and the fact that I have beautiful children, I have great grandchildren, I have a wife that still loves me after all the stuff we've been through in 37 years and challenges and struggles. So those are the things that I'm most grateful for. I don't know if there's pride is in that, but I'm most grateful for that. Yeah, and before I get to, to the last question, I just want to ask one other, one other thing. And that's, you're a, a big family man. You express that even, even your father and growing up and Italians, I feel like in general, just huge on, on family. It's part of the culture. Yes. And as you reflect on, on your family life and everyone that's in it, if you could just say something to your family as a whole, the Francis family, in just a reflection of growing up in this family, what would you say, and I'm interested, who are two people you would thank, and what would you say to them? Within my immediate family? Within, like, it could be an aunt, an uncle, grandma, grandpa. Well, one thing that comes to mind that has been a, a guiding principle in my life, 
I'll tell you a quick story. My mom was pretty rough on me, you know. Um, I mean, discipline-wise. I always say my, my, my father, it was my mother that really made a man out of me because she never, she didn't hold back anything. She, she was old school. She'd have, if she wanted to hit you, she'd hit you with that kind of a thing. But I remember one time I was 10 years old and my mom was mad at me as usual for something. And I think she hit me, I don't know. And I walked out of the room and I had tears in my eyes because I was angry, not because I was hurt. And my uncle Joe, my grandmother's uh, sister's husband was a merchant Marine for 25 years, hard drinking, just, you know, hard, tough type, type of guy. And I walked into the room and he looked at me and I loved him. And he looked at me and he said, what's the matter with you? I said, oh, my mom, you know, she's on me again and this and that. And that. He says, you got tears in your eyes? I said, I'm so mad. He says, let me tell you something, Michael. I said, what, Uncle Joe? He said, I'm going to get a dictionary. I want you to look up one word. I said, what's that? He said, sympathy. Look it up and don't ever look for it again, ever in your life. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. So I always try my life. I never made myself a victim. I never wanted to be a sympathetic character. I try to take responsibility for everything that I've done wrong in my life. And it's a much better feeling than having people feel sorry for you or wanting to be a sympathetic figure. So that was a tremendous impact because it stayed with me the whole time. You know, um, listen, the, uh, the other, I mean, look, my dad, my dad gave me so many words of wisdom. Um, I mean that, but you know, the other figure would have to be my, my wife. I mean, she has been my total support. She has, she's just, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. You know, I mean, she's held me accountable. She won't stand for, she's not, in, she's not in awe of me, which I'm glad, <laughs> you know, she tells me straight, I'll give you one thing. I, I was in a, I was in a church one day, I just tell my wife and there was about, oh, I don't know, 10,000 people there. And when I walked off the stage, Devin, and this is not unusual, people were cheering me, cheering me and, wow, you know, standing up, standing ovation. And I walked down and my wife was at the bottom of the stair and she said, she looked at me, she said, remember one thing. I said, what? She said, you're a lot more blessed than you are good. I said, I get it. <laughs> but you know what? You need that in your life. You need it in your life. And she's been there. Oh, that is, that is, to that is beautiful. I never heard you share that, that sympathy story before. That's a cool one. And I'm going to take that with me as well. So thank you for sharing that. And it seems to me just observing and listening that it seems you prefer this type of fame that you now have as compared to the fame that you once had. Instead of running or the cops running towards you and you trying to escape, now people are running towards you, asking for interviews and wanting a piece of you, and you're just accepting it and loving it. Because I believe, and I've heard you say this, that this is really what you were called to do. This is the greater purpose that you believe that God had in your life, and you're embracing it. And Michael, I just wanna tell you that it's incredible. It's incredible. I, I can't tell you how many people, I, I told a couple of people about this and they said, oh my goodness, I can't wait to hear it. I appreciate it so much, but I cannot leave without asking this very last question, Michael, as you look at your 70 years of life and God willing, at least another 33 so you can reach your dad, but hopefully another 40, 50. As you look over uh, back at your life and a whole lot of experiences, but as you continue to grow, what do you hope one day your contribution would have been to this world and, and the legacy of Michael Francis? Well, number one, that he was a, a, a tremendous husband, father, and grandfather. That's primary for me. Um, that he was true to his faith, even though there was a lot of questions throughout his life. At the end of his life, we see that it was real. He was true to his faith. And that people in general just say that I was a benefit to them, you know, in some way, shape or form. I don't think there could be any, I don't think there can be anything better than that in, in life, you know, really. Um, I, if I really, if you told to me, Michael, take 24 hours to think about it, I don't think there'd be anything else that I could say. I mean, what, what do you want? My legacy is, is my family, you know, that's it. And that's where it lives on. And, um, and look, 
You know, I, I, I realized one thing, Devin, the power of YouTube, I, I have to say this, I've done a lot through, I've had, I've been in the media's eye and had attention basically since I'm 19, 20 years old. Um, it doesn't mean a lot to me, uh, but YouTube, I've never witnessed anything. I got into YouTube because 42 speaking dates of mine were postponed during COVID. I never even looked at YouTube. I didn't know anything about I know anything about it. My team around me said, Michael, you got to start doing YouTube. I said, you know, I don't like to be I, honestly, you if you talk to my team, they're always dragging me into the studio to do the, these content things. It's all about content, 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 but they're driving me crazy, but I have to do it. I understand it. The power of YouTube worldwide. I have never been noticed. My brand has never grown bigger. I grew bigger in a year than I did in 20 years prior to that, all because of YouTube. I'd be getting offers to do this because, you know, we're approaching 700,000 subscribers in a year. Don't ask me how that happened. It just happened. And so much has happened as a result of that. So, you know, the brand is building. So now I'm so conscious of wanting it to be perceived in the right way. I'll tell you something. I'll, I'll end it with this. I did a YouTube today about murder in the mob. And it, out of all the YouTubes that I've done in the past year, this is shot up in views faster than any other one. And I was really disturbed by that because there's a lot of guys talking about murder. I'm talking about how ugly murder is. But the fact that murder was in the keyword, it, it, and I'm saying, man, what? What kind of world do we live in when murder becomes so attractive? The word becomes so attractive. That's not what I want to be known for. And I tried to tell people in this video, I don't want, if you people don't think I'm a gangster because I didn't murder people, that's a compliment to me. I'm not mad at you for saying that, but it's just, I don't know, uh, Devin, the world has gone crazy in many ways. You know? I, it's so funny you mentioned that, Michael, because I saw that. Maybe you posted it about eight, eight or seven hours ago. Yeah. And I, I was literally thinking to myself, I said, this video is going to explode just because it's so, it's like a trigger word. People see it, they say, I want it, I want it. But Michael, I want to say that you also exemplify one last thing I want to say. And that's really the power of relationship capital, that you've been able to develop relationships with people that can take you places that you couldn't take by by yourself or let's take a patrick bet david who it seems like you have become very close with a very influential person uh you've been on vlad tv three or four times and your ability to develop these relationships with people has it's really incredible to me and i look at it from a an aspect of you in your former life developing relationships knowing that you couldn't do it all by yourself and here you are again. So it's it's Michael Francis lived a different life, but in, in some ways I could tell that you're just a, a, the same person in your heart. You're just doing it, building these relationships. And I, I'm so excited for you. And that's why I mentioned it. All of these relationships have opened up so many opportunities for you. And I wanna be the first one to congratulate you and say thank you for the work that you are doing. And I want you to say thank you to Camille for me because you told me that she is the one that said you gotta do this with Devin. So Michael, thank you so much for, for stopping here with me today and spending the last hour and five minutes or so chatting with me. It's meant the world. And lastly, Michael, if somebody wants to work with you or I think there is an inner circle that people can join, yes. can you tell us about any opportunities to work further with you or expand that? Yes, in the past year also, you know, um, as a result of the pandemic, we created a, uh, a community, um, my crew and my inner circle. And they're two, they're separate and apart, but they're also joined in, in many ways. And just yesterday, or this past weekend, I had 40 members of my inner circle, there's about a thousand of them, come out to California. We spent Saturday together. Uh, they came to my Slices Pizza place. Uh, we took them on a yacht trip and we had dinner. We did a whole bunch of things. And again, it's all about community. It's all about me giving them the benefit of my experience in both leadership and business and life skills. And you know, what's even more satisfying, Devin. They're now encouraging one another. Mm. 
it's become a community of people encouraging one another for the right reasons. And it's been so satisfying that we've been able to do this. People, I had people in tears yesterday saying, Michael, you have no idea what this year has meant to me. And not only me being, you know, a part of it, it the, the community that they've had with other, you know, you know what I'll, I'll, I'll compare it to. It's, it's funny that in many of the churches that I went to now in the last year, small groups have exploded people getting together, sharing ideas, struggles, uh, uh, successes. People need to be involved with one another on a positive level. And that's what we've created. So, um, you know, and it's growing daily. It really is. And it's very, very satisfying. So, you know, that's michaelfrancis.com. That's the best way through my website. Of course, you know, I'm on all the social media platforms. We need, we need to do all of that. Um, I'm very easy to reach and I, I really encourage people. We, 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 we try to respond to everybody and, and, uh, and do something positive. That's what this is all about. Michael, you're a man's man. And I thank you for being here with me today. It's been a true treat and a pleasure. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. I learned so much. Michael, you have a terrific night. And I'm so happy to bring this out to the world. So, Michael, I say thank you so much. I appreciate that. One last thing, Devin. Uh, yesterday in church, I did this in Oceanside, California, not too far from Camp Pendleton. And I've spoken there a couple of times to troops and their families when they're being deployed in, in different places. And it was funny. Every Marine that came up to me when I was signing books, you know, not in uniform, just church guys, I looked at them and said, you're a Marine, you're a Marine, you're a Marine, without them saying a word. You know, they just hold themselves in a way that I'm just so proud of them for being, you know, for being Marines and, and, and I'm patriotic in that way. So I just want you to I have a tremendous respect for the minister, uh, for the military and any which way that I can be of assistance or service. And I mean that from my heart. Uh, you call on me and I, and I will do whatever I can. I really mean that. I was named after an uncle who died in World War II, mm. and my mom, you know, named him, named me after him. So uh, I, I extend that offer, Devin, anytime in the future. And that's one of the main reasons. As soon as Camille said, "No, I like Devin. You got to do this," and I, well, who is he? Well, he was <laughs> the military. I'll do it. <laughs> well, Mike, it's been a great time. Thank you so much, and best of luck to you, your future endeavors. And I cannot wait to see all of the good stuff that you have coming soon. All right, my friend. Most appreciated. Have a good evening.